Good afternoon, fellow Kung Fu movie fans. This is Gary Williams of FilmFanDojo.com. And today I am here with a very special guest. This is Sifu Jan Lucanus. Hey, Sifu Jan, how's it going? Doing great. <laughs> <It's just> banana. <laughs> oh, you're doing really great. So for all the people that don't know, I met Sifu Jan on a panel, HBC, HBC UConn panel sponsored by Urban Action Showcase. A uh, month and a half ago, and I was so taken by his passion for the Kung Fu movies and then his passion for his many, many projects. And he's a multi uh, media guru in a lot of ways. So we're going to get into that talk. But before we get into that specific talk, Sifu Jan, can you give our viewers and listeners uh, some of your background? How, how, what do we need to know about Sifu Jan? Uh, I, I'd say right now it, it's it's really focused on making movies with the world, you know, uh, being able to create a platform where everybody can star in their own movies and shows, and that platform is called Real World, R E E L W U R L D, and that's our our company we're building. And our first project is called Justice for Hire, and it's like Uber for heroes. You can hire a hero or become one and get paid. Uh, our social network is the cinematic universe and anybody can join the cast via their phone and you get guided in creating your own mini movies about your own story, uh, you know, unleashing the, like your inner hero or, or villain if you want or whatever, whatever you want to, to play as and all the stories tie together the whole all the content is tied together united by story so that's, that's really the main focus and all of that comes from you know, growing up in the comic book business, my dad's a writer, my, my parents are both martial artists. Working with the sector of the entertainment business, video games, music, um, all across the board and realizing that, hey, everyone's got the same, the same challenges that is called by different names. And, and uh, so our solution to those challenges is, hey, like you really engage people at their core, at their heart and with their story and unlock that. That's really the end goal or any show that they're really looking to, to touch they're really looking to monetize people but at the you know but at the core of that monetization is the decision whether or not to hand over your money to a franchise show etc your time your valuable time and your heart so if you if for me it's like you kind of look deeper than the money you actually really find that there's some really amazing beautiful very spiritual, very, very powerful stuff that, that happens when someone gives you their time and their attention. And the, the only way to honor that, in my opinion, is to empower that person's heart, their story, their world. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay. That's, but yeah, it's a lot. And not, <laughs> you know, that's not in a bad way, but it's a lot of aspects to this because, you know, if people, many people may not know, there's a, and I'm correct me if I'm mistaken, there's a comic book, uh, Justice for Hire, too, correct? There is. Can you tell, can you tell us about uh, the comic book and can you kind of tell us about where this idea came from? What spurred you to, to create this? Um, I, so, so, yes, there's a comic book, and the comic book was actually based on short films I was doing uh, since high school. And the idea for the short films came from, really stems from looking at my father as a superhero. And my dad was, was such a, you know, he's, he was entrenched in the comic book world. He was a comic book critic and then he, he became a writer. Um, his mentor was Jim Shooter, the editor in chief mm. of Marvel. And so, and I grew up going to Marvel with my dad, going to DC, <laughs> going to Valiant and said Defiant, which was another one of Jim's companies mm -hmm. and being able to, to spend time there and to see how all these people were, were pulling together stories. But that's, that's more on the storytelling side. My dad himself, being a martial artist, um, you know, I looked at him as, as Spider-Man. I used to have a, a fantasy that my dad was Spider-Man <laughs> and that I was like the, a little kid Spider-Man <laughs> and that we could swing and like hang from like the Brooklyn Bridge. I always thought about that, like hanging upside down from the Brooklyn Bridge from like one of those little tunnels with the cars drive through under the bridge and uh, near Brooklyn Heights where I grew up. And so um, I just remember how powerful that desire was. And 
when the opportunity came to start to tell a story, uh, you know, I thought about what would happen if someone exposed me to Pulp Fiction, not that I saw the movie, but mm -hmm. in high school, I saw um, John Travolta and, and, uh, and Sam Jackson. And I said, what if those guys had sons? <laughs> that and, would be something. Like, what would their kids be like? And so I, it immediately started me on this journey of taking the desire that I had of, of being a superhero of my dad and starting to tell a father-son story mm. uh, about two, two like vigilantes that had sons and what their kids grew up to be like. Mm. And that became the, the foundation for the short films, which became the foundation for the comic book series, which became the foundation for um, the, the entire Justice for Hire cinematic universe um, that, that we're doing on Real World, where essentially mm -hmm. anybody can join the cast. And interestingly enough, the father and son characters as they were in the comics are the only characters right now that are not in the story. Mm. Um, so it's, it's for me, a lot of, uh, so much was put into that. Uh, I think that, you, that as a creator, you can, you can use something to develop yourself and your skills. And then that, that one thing that catalyzed it is the one thing that may not necessarily be, be the, a key component anymore. And mm -hmm. so the father son narrative um, the characters were, were Ebony and Ivory. Everyone kind of thought there was a 1970s play. And I was like, no, it's actually more about yin and yang. And we got so much uh, emphasis on the naming of the father-son characters, <laughs> two generations of Ebony and Ivory. Um, it, it, we just kind of, I, I said, you know what? That's not the narrative that I want people mm -hmm. to get to focus on anymore. I want them to get, and maybe those characters will make it back in. Um, so we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay, that's that's very interesting and very creative. And you and you mentioned skills, and and I want people to know you got some skills. Okay, yeah. you were the push hands champion from two thousand. Correct me if I'm wrong. Two thousand nine to two thousand and eleven. Uh, so there, there's push hands. I, I, I'll, I'll just clarify what that means. I was the coach uh, and captain of the U.S. Tai Chi push hands team, which is the grappling aspect of Tai Chi from 2009 to 2011. And, uh, you know, we, we, we took the team to a bunch of golds. Uh, myself, I got the, uh, the silver at the 2010 World Cup. So I lost oh, the gold wow. by one point, which means I need to go back and get it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but prior to that, you know, I had two gold cups at the, at the, the Tai Chi. In, in 2004, I had two gold cups at the, uh, at the, the uh, World Championships in Taiwan and, okay. and the Tai Chi grappling. Our whole team swept a lot of gold there. Um, so it's, it's a big part of my life. And it, the, the talent pool in the United States is very, very low. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that there is not a true understanding of what the grappling aspect of Tai Chi is. Mm -hmm. It's highly underdeveloped here. It's highly developed in Taiwan. The mm -hmm. best players in the world are, are in Taiwan. We're very close. <clears throat> you know, I consider him an a, 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 a ally and a rival. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 16-time world champ who's out there, uh, Chen Zicheng, oh, and yeah. he's great. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a huge part of my life. And before that, I fought Sancho. So I had okay. the, um, in the college, I, I fought boxing, kickboxing, wrestling Sancho okay. for Lee Tai Lung uh, on his uh, New York international team. And, um, and just getting hit in the face and, and having terrifying experiences with, with, <laughs> you wow. know, there helped me wow. a lot with uh, okay. grappling stuff, so. Cool. Now for, our, for people like myself who are not familiar with uh, Tai Chi push hands or Tai Chi grappling, can you explain you know, as best you can to us who are like ignorant of it, exactly just explain like what it is as best you can to us laymen. Sure. So Tai Chi push hands, I, I, I like to call it uh, mindful wrestling. And it's, there is a system, like this amazing system that spans from single person exercises all the way up to, to you know, multiple two person exercises of, of varying speeds. And you start out slow because you're building, I mean, anyone who, do, who's, who does personal training, for example, you know, knows the, the, the power and the, the importance of, of time under tension mm -hmm. to, to really develop the physique that, that, that you might want, the strength and the physique, the dense muscles. So Tai Chi, while it does have all these amazing, like there is chi, you know, there's all mm -hmm. this stuff that is not part of the, the Western, um, uh, really the Western mindset. 
And I think that's where people get tripped up is that like when someone starts talking about chi, it, it sounds like, you know, this, this woo thing. Mm -hmm. And, and then you have people that want to be gurus that, <laughs> you know, essentially want, want you to believe that woo woo thing. Mm -hmm. And, and you get this whole different experience rather than the true practical human performance tool that Tai Chi actually is. And that's not to say that I'm, I'm, I'm speaking against the Chi or anything like that. I'm saying that, that what it is, is so many things that are very, very practical in daily life that supercharge you. So you do these slow exercises, you build up time under tension with the slow exercises and the ability to speed up your perception by slowing yourself down. Mm -hmm. And so then when you start to do the fast grappling, the explosive joint manipulation, essentially like the, the sport of Tai Chi Push has played in Taiwan is Greco-Roman wrestling. And <laughs> you know, it's like, it's you, you throw someone on the floor, you push them out of a ring. There's two mm -hmm. games that's called moving step. There's another game where you stand on pedestals and you blast the guy off the pedestal wow. and it's, joint, it's explosive joint manipulation. But if you don't know what you're looking at, you're like, well, why are these guys pushing each other around? Mm -hmm. And the, the real experience that, I, that is totally missing from, especially from the grappling mindset in the States, which is why I can play with any grappler. Like I, I, I am happy to, to grapple with anybody. It doesn't matter how heavy you are. It doesn't matter what your title, you likely don't do what I do. And it's that, it's the area of your unknowing, <laughs> you know, and my knowing of, of how to, to, to leverage that, that makes me, uh, strong in what I do. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, you know, I play with UFC fighters, I play with Olympic boxers. I play, I, like I play, you know, John Machado, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a mentor of mine, you know, like, so we, I, like I play with real, real players and this stuff is valuable for everybody. And <clears throat> so like my, my main thing that I want people to get with Tai Chi or mindful wrestling in particular is that it really is a system to slow you down, to speed up your perception, perception and give you a massive amount of strength at any moment in your shift of balance on, with your body or playing with an opponent. And to be able to know that any part of your body that's touching an opponent is a leverage point, even if it's one limb. And so that to me is, is, is probably the key takeaway and, and building from there, all the others, it's a gateway into all the other stuff. If you want it mm -hmm. all the, like the chi, the healing, all this other stuff, but the game itself is, is very much high performance. Uh, it, it, it trains you for high performance and it's something that I use in business every day. Okay. Yeah. And I've, I've seen you, uh, it was an Instagram video, um, of you in the gym with this like wrestler I think I he I don't want to say mistaken because I don't know if he was a UFC f contender fighter or train trainer but it, you were grappling you guys were were um grappling and he was trying to move you but he couldn't move you it's like on your I think it's on your Instagram and it was a like maybe a few weeks ago I'm just perusing through I'm like oh this looks interesting and just what you're saying you know I'm no martial arts master but I could see what you were saying in that exchange, it was very interesting because for me and I'm sure other people, I've never really seen Tai Chi in that light. You know, when we see it, we see the media perception, the old people in the park, and they're like, <laughs> yeah, and they're like, or you see the movie perception, which if it's a 90s or above movie, everybody's flying through the air and yeah. just so it's very interesting. But you you grew up in a in a martial arts household. How, how was that to grow up that way? It's pretty delightful. You know, the, 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 the um, I'll say that the, it's a gift that I do my best to give my son and <clears throat> to see both of your parents training and not only that, to, but, but to be able to be around their teachers, their masters uh, gave me an immediate understanding. Well, not, I don't want to say understanding it gave me the time under tension mm -hmm. of master seeing masters and to see someone in their, in, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s be strong, stronger than people in their 20s and 30s. <clears throat> and to see the reverence that people address them with, it, it, it gave me a foundation of the clarity of the value of longevity. And all my training since, since I really started taking martial arts seriously, because I didn't take it as seriously as a kid, 
Um, but all my tra training since, since high school has been focused on longevity mm -hmm. and being able to, to, to know that, Hey, like I should be able to at <clears throat> 90, you know, my dad at 54 years old, won a Tai Chi world cup, mm. you know, he got his rib broken by a 17 year old to get that world cup, but he's got a title. So, <laughs> you know, like that's 54 years old. And, you know, you look at, 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 at you know, like, like the black dragon, Ron Grant, Van mm -hmm. Clint, you know, and he's still competing. Like that's longevity. That's the power. Mm -hmm. And, and what a gift to be able to give a child and what a gift to be able to give society. If we can, if we can work, at, you know, all, all of us as martial artists can work to, to distribute that, that particular value set of saying live life for longevity. To, to be able to spread the most happiness and joy from your body and mind and spirit to others, you know? And, and, and that starts with how you move and express yourself, which starts with the breath and the visualization and the body mechanic. And that to me is just, what a gift. Like what, what a core value. <laughs> right, <laughs> <You know? laughs> right, right. Yes, I mean, were, were your parents Chinese stylists as well? Um, For the most part, absolutely. They started with karate and then that got them into Kung Fu and Tai Chi. Okay. And so, you know, I grew up in a Kung Fu Tai Chi family and it took me a while to expand, to deepen and to expand beyond um, some of the, uh, the, essentially the limitations of any cultural style, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm still in the process of that, but, but to accept boxing you know when I started mm -hmm. boxing in, in high school like it took me a while because I'm like man this is you have a different approach and this is actually at odds with some of the stuff I'm learning and it, mm -hmm. and it took me a while to actually understand how it wasn't at all at, at odds mm -hmm. but um, the teachers didn't necessarily have the the uh, the lexicon they didn't have the language to be able to bridge for me and one of my main things in martial arts or business or media is essentially like thematically for me, it's just the bridges. Like how do I create the bridge between the experiences to distill them so that it, people can simply understand and then actually use them for themselves? Wow, that's, that's deep. Yes, your, your background, I mean, I was reading up on your website. Uh, your background is so very, that's why it's so interesting to talk with you. You mentioned earlier competing in Sancho. Can you tell us about that experience? I mean, you've had a lot of experience in it, but you know, like generally how, how, one, how did you become interested? And then two, what do you feel that you got from Sancho? What were some of his lessons for you as a person and as a martial artist? That's a, that's a, that's a strong question. <laughs> so, so, so the Sancho was a really powerful experience. And I, and I, and I, it was, I was 18 years old. I was with my, my, buddy and one of my, uh, you know, closest, closest uh, friends, uh, uh, Hinton Wells, and we were in, um, in Chinatown, because, you know, I, I grew up in Chinatown, New York, and, and, and spent a lot of time there. And, and you know, we, we go eat, and we go to the Kung Fu store, and, and you know, <laughs> that's, that's part of what you do. <laughs> you know, and I, we saw this, this uh, you know, little flyer for the Kung Fu Strike Challenge that had Ryu and Ken on it. Okay. I was like, <laughs> I was like, what is this thing? And it speaks directly to me. And I was 18 and I saw it and I'm like, hey, let's go and let's train for this and let's fight. And I had never fought before. Um, I was recently, I returned to martial arts when I was 15. I returned to training. Uh, and so, uh, you know, between nine and 15, I did not train. I actually got like, I lost a fight, got beat up by like an entire family and like denounced the martial arts. It's like a whole thing. So, <laughs> but so at 18, from 15 to 18, like, I don't consider that a lot of time under your belt in terms of, uh, um, you know, unless you're really focused on training to fight, like I was, mm -hmm. I was still just getting into the spirit of the martial arts again. So I had to learn quickly how to, how to spar and I was already sparring, but I needed to take it to another level. Cause I was like, okay, I'm going to go into my first tournament. And all I want to do is win a round, you know, in front of my <laughs> pop. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I just want to win one round in front of my dad. <laughs> and and i'll feel good and um you know we we, we i was at the the usa shaolin temple at the time and, and my dad had his own tai chi school and there was already tension between that like me doing tai chi and the teacher not necessarily thinking the tai chi the uh, um the monk at the usa shaolin temple who's wonderful xian Ming, he's mm -hmm. great i actually love him um 
but uh, you know, it, it was his perspective that someone my age should not be doing Tai Chi, but that's for when you're older, which mm -hmm. in my opinion is completely wrong. <laughs> you should be doing Tai Chi at six years old. My son does Tai Chi. <laughs> He's been doing it since he was four. Wow. It's very important. <laughs> but uh, th like what I'm getting at is that being uh, in this position where, you know, I, there's, uh, I, I, I couldn't kick above my hips um, I, so I need to start doing yoga mm -hmm. and <laughs> to get my hips more flexible. My mom was like, you can't kick that high. You need to go to <laughs> yoga with, with Joseph Penna. And, uh, you know, he's still my, my only yoga master in New York. And, um, so, you know, I, I started preparing, we started sparring anybody we could. And, you know, I got there and we, um, end up winning the tournament, like myself and mommy, Hinton Robbie oh. Webster. Um, and we were, every stylist that won, uh, was an internal practitioner, um, wow. which, you know, like including Nobel G bell, who mm -hmm. is the black Taoist and, you know, he's a Bakwa stylist. So he became the captain of that team. And, um, you know, to make a, a very long detailed story short, uh, which includes me getting kicked out of the Shaolin temple and, and, wow. and going to, um, you know, train with Li Tai Long in Corona Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, I, there was a lot, there was a lot of, there was a lack of care for, for me. We were, you know, we got, we, this was semi-pro, you know, we got a little mm -hmm. allowance. We got, uh, you know, our, our travel covered, you know, like we were getting, you know, wow. like I, I was feeling good about my, like, oh, wow. Like I'm going to go and fight pros. Like I, I won a tournament for my first time fighting. And now I get to fight the pro Beijing team of Sancho, which wow. we did, we fought them twice. And um, there was just like, my father had to, 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 to step up, uh, you know, as a coach at one point and, and take over um, because we, it, a lot of stuff happened, man. It was really, really intense. Um, a lot of like, I, I would just pl flat out call it um, lack of care and, and potentially corruption mm. and getting an, in, an instance um, and, and that's, and that's not to say that I don't have like deep respect for everybody involved. I have deep respect for, for all my teammates, um, for all the people who came and challenged me because I had the most coveted position on the team in terms of weight class. So people were coming like nationwide to fight me, which was terrifying for me because <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't have people who cared enough about, um, you know, like a fight team. I didn't really have a fight team. I had my, my buddy, Ian Morgan, who was my first fight choreographer, who's a beast, who's a champion these days. Um, but, you know, he helped a lot. And, and, um, but this, tr and I learned a lot. I was just thinking about Li Tai Lang last night and his side kick and front kick. I learned so much from all these people, but I also learned that the fight game can be dirty. Mm. And that as a kid in college, I was at NYU in film school and training, you know, my martial arts, but also like, you know, like, being in, in, around all this creativity and recognizing like, huh, you know, for some people, the fighting is the way out. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a passion there that I deeply love and respect. But if I keep fighting, that's not my way out. Mm -hmm. And, and, and whether you want to call it out or up or wh whatever direction it is, <laughs> like fighting for me was not something that I, I needed to do outside of a handful of, of experiences. And I still mm -hmm. intend to, 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 that handful is not over. I, I've mm -hmm. fought technically three times. I fought at the, the, the um, I mean, you know, I, I fought many people, but, but I, at three events, I, I fought at, at two, of the, the, two of them were the pro Sancho team in, in Beijing, from Beijing in New York at the Maritime Hotel in 2001. Mm -hmm. And prior to that was 2000 at the, uh, also the Maritime Hotel for Lee Tailang's qualifying tournament. So, I still want to do a, a few more fights uh, and MMA fights. Um, and I absolutely plan to do that, but that's not something that is like, Hey, I need to do this next year, the year mm -hmm. after. And it's, you know, fighting is entertainment, you know, like there, there's the martial arts side of it, which is the spirit, mm -hmm. but the actual promotion of it is entertainment. So for me as an entertainment professional working, I want to work and I'm like, I'll fight when I'm ready. And <laughs> right. I will set the terms of my fight. Because, you know, I know guys right now that are dear friends that are pro fighters that are having trouble, you know, in the game because of the way the game is set up. And the game mm -hmm. and the fight game is actually set up the same way the music business, same, very similar to film business, very similar to TV. They're actually all really similar. So mm -hmm. if you just kind of look at it, and it as, as a martial arts style, 
you know, if you, if you really look at style and say, okay, well, every style essentially has like foundationally like the same core mechanics, then you can kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to apply, you know, what, how, whatever's gotten you to the height of your particular discipline, you can mm -hmm. apply to every discipline. So that's kind of my mentality with returning to the fight game. Um, but it was, your question was essentially like, how was it? And it was, it was great. It was formative. Me getting kicked out of the Shaolin Temple was a huge part, one of the greatest gifts I ever got. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most painful experiences I ever got uh, in terms of, of um, feeling like I was a part of something and then, it, uh, and then having to walk away with, with dignity and to then uh, have the responsibility of it, not the, the responsibility, the inner feeling where I have to recreate the temple everywhere mm -hmm. I go. And so that, that to me, that, that temple experience was, I'll send anybody and everybody. If you want to train Kung Fu, go and train with Xi'an Ming in New York. It's an amazing, the USA Shaolin Temple is phenomenal. Um, and, you know, like Riza and all his folks, are, <laughs> yeah. his, his crew. Um, but like for me, taking that experience, I've never experienced a school that created that temple feeling. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to walk with that and to bring that around, it, um, to me is a big deal. So I, I do my best to share that 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 feeling as much as I can. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I mean, wow, that's a that's a interesting experience. That's that's cool. No, I think it's cool though. It's cool. And then I wanted to um just expound on something that you mentioned about a lot of these industries having a similar foundation or a similar way of being. Because you mentioned this in one of in one of your um YouTube videos about um people creating their own platforms or using their skills to create can you speak more to that because i think that's that's kind of the point that you're making with a lot of these industries being the same and finding your center to create um what you manifest what you want to create can you tell our audience about that i think you just said it i mean <laughs> well it, it sounds better coming from you oh I, I think that's really the core of 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 of, of really life you know, from, from my perspective at this point, and, and my perspective is constantly evolving and expanding, uh, uh, hopefully. And so, you know, uh, the, uh, it, I think it's so important to be able to find your center line. And there, are, you know, just that, that whole, the whole concept of the imaginary string from the top of the head, which happens in martial arts, happens in yoga, happens across the board. There's all this data now. I just watched a CEO uh, open his Zoom meeting with establish the imaginary string, breathe deeply into the base diaphragm. They call it the diaphragm, but you actually have three sets of diaphragms. So like, you know, when you say base diaphragm, you get more specific, like there's the, you know, the lower Dan Tian, three finger length below the belly button. So like, but essentially imaginary string lifts you up, find your center line and then building everything you do from there. To, and to me, that's just so important metaphorically and practically because when you're, whether you're training or you're making a decision in life, because your training should prepare you to make any decision in life, um, it's really all coming from the same place. So if we all work on that core and our core awareness and then make the decisions from there, we're, that to me is optimization. You know, you really go beyond good and evil. In our culture, we're so much about like, oh, this is good, this is bad, like, you know, those are really based on the glasses you wear. It's really about, for, for again, from my perspective, um, the optimization of society is a, is a huge deal. And, and that, that starts with the optimization of you and how do you, you know, make the decisions that are most aligned for your life. So, um, you know, that this, this is a philosophical conversation, but it becomes very practical when it comes to um, like, what you're going to do next, literally, like, you know, after this, this, this interview is done, what I'm going to say next, what, you know, what you're going right. to do next, what a person is going to go and do after this. So it's like, it, it's, it's as heavy and as light as that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good way to put it. That's true. It's true. So your, your philosophy seems to be, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems to me to be practical and theoretical you know, like, I guess mostly everything is, but practical and theoretical, how much of that do you attribute to your, your martial arts, specifically your Tai Chi and Kung Fu training? Oh, a, a vast majority of it. Uh, I'll say that, that, you know, growing up in a family with a, with, with a, with a spiritual guru, which was massively helpful, 
uh, and helpful to this day. So essentially, like wh whatever the quote unquote, whatever the focus of your your spiritual life is, and some people may not have that, which you know, like I like I I send as much love and light to those people, like to find what that means for them, whether you want to call it universe or you want to call it whatever. I mean, like there's all these terms none of them are actually accurate, <laughs> you know? Uh, so like, but being able to find that, that, that inner quiet that uh, gives you the information that no one else can give you. Mm -hmm. Like that to me is, is, is uh, like you need a system to find that for yourself. And the reason you need a system is because you need to be able to test. You need to be able to have controls. The controls for the litmus test to be able to say, okay, I worked on this over here and this, I got a positive feedback loop here and I did this other thing and I got a negative feedback loop. You know, mm -hmm. social media is all based on the positive feedback loop mm -hmm. because you get dopamine hits every time you get the positive <laughs> feedback loop. And so you, you, you know, if you're, if you're watching this, you know, you're probably on social media platform and you're on a platform that is a system that is based on testing so that you stay. And because you get the positive feedback loop. And so you need to have your own system before you engage someone else's system. And that to me is just such a, it's so important. If you like, we all need it and it has to be developed every day. It has to be refined every day. And so it, it really turns the daily experience. It, it turns you into a scientist of your own life. I love that terminology. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza said that like, you know, it, it once. And I, I love that. <laughs> And I was just like, man, like it's the scientists of your own life, like be great and let science study you because science is the study of, mm. so it is not the end. It, it is the study of, and it is a result of study. So you actually have to do the study for yourself. And um, so I, my, 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 the, the practical and the theoretical to me means like the testing and then the contemplation. So you have to think about it yourself of how, how does somebody respond when I say this? Like how, how does, how does the, how does this, this, my body language affect how people respond to me? It's one of the key things that we do in Tai Chi push hands. Uh, and I don't want to say Tai Chi push hands, like people who do Tai Chi push hands do this because that is not true. Like, <laughs> right. yeah, per se. I'm saying that the, the team that I'm from, which was coached by Josh Waitzkin, the, 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 you know, the chess champ, the product, the child project, mm -hmm. my, my big brother, he, he supercharged my life because he gave me insights into, into how people behave, it, like physically, how, how people emotionally respond, how they, how they think and how to press buttons to get the response that I want mm -hmm. out of a person when it comes to competition or, or life. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and this is a, you know, it's an iterative process. You're constantly building on this, but like this stuff is so important because it's how people respond to you. And so it starts again with your system, your ability to test that. So whether you pick Kung Fu or, you know, like Christianity or Buddhism mm -hmm. or, you know, Hinduism or like painting or dance, right. like, you know, whatever discipline you choose to be able to find that core system inside yourself, like, and, and, and have the introspective moments so that you can see how your discipline can be applied in your life in a daily basis. How do you make your life dance? How do you make mm -hmm. your life? Um, that to me is like, like, I don't believe in hobbies. Mm -hmm. So like, like, you know, it's like, this is what we do. And, and, and like the one thing actually affects the other thing and you build upon it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it can be intense sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good way to, well, I like that. I'm going to have to, okay. You got me thinking, um, it's speaking of, of complimenting. So you mentioned that, um, Master, I'm sorry, I speak uh, halfway, speak Portuguese. Master Machado, one of the Machados. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm a, I, I, wow, I love the way you said Machado. <laughs> yeah, I, I, teach, I teach and play capoeira, so I oh, like Oh, that's that. awesome. Yeah, yeah. So um, you mentioned that one uh, of the Machados is your, a mentor. Yes, John Machado. John Machado, okay. Um, and I saw him in the uh, Justice for Hire movie he's one of he's one of the uh i forget his character's name but he's one of the good guys so he 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 was he was that that is a it is no longer canonical okay okay <laughs> yeah. so like, like that that is the previous before we rebooted justice for Hire. okay 
uh, with with this new cinematic universe, we we have a lot of interconnected pieces of content that, that connect the, the comic book story narrative uh, storyline. So John Machado played Rom from the comic books. Okay. Uh, John will come back in this yes. new Justice for Hire, and and uh, and more than likely as a different character. Okay. So um, as as something that, that he's working on. So. Um, but yes, he, he's in it, but well, I, I cut you off just to, no, that was, that was not good. canonical. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. We got to get that out there with my power Rangers shirt on. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I kept looking at like, yeah, like, So yeah, he, um, so he's, a, of course, everyone knows, or if you don't know, he's a Br- Brazilian jujitsu master. And, and you're speaking about these interconnected things. Can you, in your experience, give us because I don't think a lot of people see it, because I know I didn't at first. Like, uh, how, do, how does the BJJ complement your Tai Chi push hands? Because oh, I see, I, it, as, I see wow. it as like two sides of the same coin, just a yes. different type of thing. But can you explain, like for you, how that complement is there? Absolutely. John Machado is the most graceful Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu teacher I've had the, the pleasure of, 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 of training under. And... Um, <clears throat> Tai Chi, Josh brought me to John Machado. Josh Waitzkin brought me to John Machado. Um, John Machado, like, you know, introduced me to Ahmed Best, you know, mm. like, you know, from Star Wars and, and all these other wonderful people. And we have a comic book with John Machado too, uh, called Fasha oh. Benita, ah. uh, Black Belt. And so um, it, it's, it, like, he's a wonderful, uh, as many martial artists are, very creative minds, you know, um, uh, which is part of the reason we're doing what we're doing right now how he framed um, the flow drills that he showed me in my first two weeks of training Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Los Angeles. I flew out to, to LA to stay with Josh and, and, and Dan Caulfield, you know, who's the, who's the assistant coach of the US Tai Chi Push Hands team. And Dan's a brilliant martial artist with his own uh, BJJ school now. Um, <clears throat> the way that they introduced me to, to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was the, was the only way I would have been able to absorb it which was essentially jam, this is Tai Chi on the ground because our Tai Chi <laughs> was integrating uh, judo. We went to go and train with Oishi judo in New York, uh, you know, Olympian. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, we, we, we trained Greco, uh, he trained Greco-Roman. We brought Greco-Roman, we brought judo into our Tai Chi. And so going to John Machado was, was going to get specific ideas to integrate into our game so that our game would be stand up and take down. Mm-hmm. And 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 continue on the ground. So the ideas, the anaconda um, uh, holds that he would do are in our push hands. They've been Josh and Dan reverse engineered with the rest of the team. Mm-hmm. They they created a a, a a laboratory experience where you were testing, constantly testing, bringing new ideas in and testing them immediately. It either works or it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And if it if it doesn't work at first, doesn't mean it can't work later. But there's none of this like, you know, touch of death kind of stuff. You know, <laughs> it was very very practical stuff. And and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, to me, is so wonderful because you can get tapped out or, or get your limb broken. Yeah. And so it's very real, very quick. Um, <clears throat> and I often think on a regular basis because John and I have had <clears throat> conversations about. Uh, formalizing how we do um, uh, the mindful wrestling system with his help. Um, mm-hmm. So that's something that we've talked about in the past uh, and creating a belt system in for, for, my, for the Tai Chi Push Ants mindful mm-hmm. wrestling perspective um, to be able to build out a more Brazilian Jiu Jitsu style um, uh, hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Of, and when I say hierarchy, I don't mean that in the ego, egoic sense, mm-hmm. but like, oh, I'm the red belt here. Right. Which is a phenomenal movie, which needs a recut. Right. <laughs> right. Anyway. Okay, yeah. we're gonna talk about that next now because I want to talk about yeah. it for real. Because like, yeah. I already talked to John about that. I do want to talk about that. Okay, Let's but um, <laughs> but you know, the, like essentially, just getting to it. John Machado brought in so much to my perspective of of push hands uh, by doing jujitsu on the ground, by seeing um, by seeing one of the greatest moments John Machado I've ever seen of any martial arts in my entire life has ever seen, I've ever seen is John Machado <clears throat> probably in 2005, 2006, um, a K1 Max fighter flies in to train with John. He's training this guy 
uh, in, in the next big fight. Um, so he comes right from Japan, gets off the plane, comes to the studio, and I'm there with Josh and I'm with Dan and I'm Ed, and then like everybody's there in the room. And the fighter walks in, really sweet, like very true gentleman, real martial artist, mm-hmm. true gentleman. I, the, I don't know the fighter's name, but I can, I can get it. Um, and he, he asks, and I love the eye contact. This is one of the most important things for me personally as a martial artist is the eye contact with the teacher mm-hmm. and being able to challenge respectfully your teacher. It is one of the most important things I've ever seen in any, any you know, in general, as, as, a, as a discipline, is how you respectfully challenge a teacher. And so he asked John to play with him in front of the whole class, mm-hmm. which puts, for most teachers, you know, you don't want to get beaten, you know, like, like a, lot, <laughs> a lot of teachers don't want to get beaten in effects, this quote unquote. <clears throat> and um, and I, I have no, no problem getting beaten. I'm like, hey, man. Mm-hmm. Beat me up and then let's put it on YouTube. People have asked me to take videos down. I'm like, why would you do that? Like you <laughs> let your students know that you're real and that you're mm-hmm. a human being and you have to, you have to lose to win sometimes. Yes. Like you have to learn something. The loss is the gift. And then you learn from that and then you go and win. Then you, then you show other people how to win. Mm-hmm. And so um, John accepted the challenge in front of everybody. And it was a long match. I mean, they were, they were rolling around. It could have been 15 minutes. Wow. It could have been a 15 minute roll. And when I say a 15 minute roll, I mean like with a world-class athlete that is, that is in peak conditioning. The guy was training for a fight. He was in peak conditioning. So John tapped the guy out with a chicken wing. And, you know, chicken wing. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> he tapped the guy out with a chicken wing and sitting up there, both sitting up and he, you know, he, he does this thing, but it was just amazing to see him in the midst of all this type of pressure. I mean, he's a world champion, obviously himself, the whole Machado brother, the, the family, um, you know, the great, but to see that and to see how open hearted he was and for him to finish, you know, finish the guy and then say to the entire class, that his conditioning is at the highest level, but it's not about conditioning. It's about the technique mm-hmm. and, and the, and the patience, like, like, and to a certain extent, like the physical conditioning, when you put quotes around it, like, you know, you're really talking about like the physical, like, okay, this guy's explosive. He's strong. His muscles mm-hmm. are great, but then there's a mental conditioning. And, and this is my perspective. These aren't John's words, but like John has the mental conditioning, the time under tension to bring himself to a place of quiet, quietude, <laughs> and to really hear it, to listen, to find those moments, to set up how he gets to his win in front of all of us. And that to me is just so powerful. And like, what, what a powerful, powerful uh, message to your students that, that it, it's, it's to be able to, to, to do that, to be able to win, it's not about the win, it's about the message of your posture, of your, of your awareness. You know, and it, to me, it, it really just drills right back down to that, that sense of core. You know, like you, the decisions you make every day, literally every word that comes out of your mouth, every thought you create, word that comes out of your mouth, every deed that you do, that really has to come from uh, that sense of quiet, your ability to listen and to make the decision that feels, like not thinks, but feels right. And if, if we all did that, then the whole world would literally look different. <laughs> you know? like, big, it'd be a big difference yeah. it'd be a big in a good way though big yeah, difference in a good way yeah. a lot of more smiles eight. too <laughs> yeah a lot more smiles that. yeah we do and be- before we get on because i want to talk about red belt oh well, we have to talk about red belt. but yeah, i want to call john machado right now I wanna, <laughs> I wanna, I, that would be nice talk about red belt. <laughs> <laughs> but i want to give him a shout out because he's done something that not a lot of BJJ people have done. They've done it since, but he was one of the first. Remember, he had a video on integrating capoeira takedowns with his BJJ. Oh, yeah. And and not a lot of people, you know, it used to be some tension years ago between capoeira practitioners, Brazilian capoeira practitioners and BJJ practitioners, you know, in Brazil Mm -hmm. years ago. But when I saw that, it it really made me feel good because he was very uh, respectful and it and it like you said it flowed right into what he was doing oh yeah and and i could tell he has that ability to kind of see things 
that complement his BJJ and he can see in a big picture sort of oh, way. So I want to definitely give him a shout out for that yeah, and thank you, him. You should talk directly to him because I, I, I'll It'd definitely be nice. like the next guy. He's amazing. <laughs> and, and I remember him and I remember him telling me about the, the I didn't know about those tensions. So this was probably like 2007, 2006, mm -hmm. 2007. Yeah. Uh, when he was telling me about this, <clears throat> and um, uh, it, it might have been a few, a few years later, but what I'm getting at is that uh, that he was he would bring capoeiristas in, mm -hmm. and as a matter of fact, the guy who uh, Chadwick Coleman, who 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 created the uh, Fascia Preta comic book, who drew it and wrote it with John Machado, was a capoeirista, mm -hmm. and so um, like there was a lot of collaboration, and John was very vocal on 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 recognizing the value. Uh, between the systems. So I think that's that's absolutely spot on. And I, I, I'd be interested to hear more about that story. So like, yeah, I, I would too. To, you know, <laughs> cool. Now we got to get into Red Belt. We got to. I'm, I'm with it. All right. So uh, your thoughts on Red Belt. What, from your perspective, you're going to have an interesting perspective on Red Belt. So Red Belt to me is one of the greatest martial arts films ever made. And uh, perhaps the greatest martial arts film ever made in the United States. And because of the spirit of it and not because of the editing of the martial arts, which is what John Machado and I recently spoke about last year because you know everyone was, was on the, the Schneider cut. Give us a Schneider cut. <laughs> like, Give me the Machado and Mamet cut of yeah. Red Belt, and, and you know because there's there's amazing stuff. I mean, like folks are in Red Belt. There's a ton mm -hmm. of people in Red Belt because like a ton of great people train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and John's always talked about how they shot all this amazing stuff and choreography. Like, please recut Red Belt. Yeah, please just recut those action scenes and put it out. Like that that makes makes no sense not to do that now, especially. Right, and so. I would just love to see that. I, would, I even offered. I'm like, look, man, I will. I will edit that. Before. You just let <laughs> me know. I, I'm let's, here to help. Let's get I don't a petition have much time started. <laughs> let's get a petition started because. Yeah, I'm serious, man. Like I would. Love I'm to serious. Do. Let's let's do it. Yeah, and, please. And, like, like 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 let's like you know this is to me it's a really big deal and and I would love to to get David Mammon involved in in, in that petition as well um, because it's just it's it's such an important movie and it really it. it one of the challenging things that, and I think in American culture is like the clarification of like honor for teachers mm -hmm. and like that movie just drills down on what the spirit is uh, of like, there's, there's a spirit of, 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 of surrender and gratitude and, and, and uh, dignity that is um, and, and, very, and very much graciousness to, to your fellow, to your fellow uh, uh, practitioners that uh, Chiwetel uh, brings with his performance. I think, I think it's, uh, uh, what's uh, Alan? Um, I forgot the, the, the Alan's last name uh, or Alan's uh, name, but, but, um, yes. his name. but he's a, I think that's one of his best performances. I, I, I was never a fan of home improvement personally. I didn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't watch the, the, Tim Allen, that's that who it is, Tim Allen. Tim Allen, yeah, yeah, yeah that's but right. his performance in that is amazing. Everyone's yeah. performance in that, it's a star-studded cast, John Machado's in it, a great uh, end sequence. And I just think that if they would have given more time to the to the action, um, it honored honored the work that that a great choreography team did, that it would have been. I remember talking to MMA fighters after that movie came out because that was a that was a 2008 release, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I went to the Tribeca Film Festival premiere with John Machado and and okay. Pat, and um, and I was I was really blown away by uh, just how powerful how powerful that was as, as, a, as a message being delivered and how MMA fighters that I knew, um, friends, like, you know, the, 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 the no us as a circle, we're just like, yeah, but you know, it's not that great of a martial arts flick. Well, I'm like, oh man, oh, we're missing the point here. Like, right. Yes, I understand what you mean. Like we need, so it's, it's I, I really want those folks to be able to, to appreciate it. Cause like when you make a movie like that, there's so many layers. Like when martial arts just has so many layers, you have people mm -hmm. who are in, the, in it for the spiritual reasons. You have in it, people who are in it for community reasons because they just, yeah. they want to be around other people and they want to be like doing something fun. Then you have people who are in it for the physical, then people who are in it for, uh, because they, they have anger inside, they need to channel it and they want to mm -hmm. fight, they want to win. They have all these different 
there's a spectrum of people that come into it. And I think when you make a martial arts film, you actually have to be aware of, of what that spectrum is. So, you know, even what we're doing right now with Justice for Hire, um, you know, we, we were known in the comic book form and then all the, the, the content around that animation, like live action, et cetera, uh, we were known as the, the most downloaded, I mean, like we were, and factually we set records as the most downloaded martial arts comic book series. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for us, we have a, 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 our foundational martial arts following. And now that we're doing the reboot, the martial artists have been asking on YouTube, where's the martial arts? Right. And, and so they're like, well, like this isn't nearly as martial artsy as, as the previous stuff because the previous one was really more so of a modern Kung Fu movie mm -hmm. told in like a Hollywood fashion. And, and all of that, like I had to re realign myself and say, well, hold on for a second. What is the spirit of what we're, and then let's layer action on top of that. Okay. And so like, I, 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 I'm still in the process of follow. I'm, I'm saying all this to say that I'm still in the process of following through with what I just said about red belt or any martial arts film, which is that you need to, when you're creating it, you, and, and, and you need to be aware that martial arts contains so many different personas. Yeah. And ideally you can serve something that speaks to each one of those personas um, so that everybody can get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And they also want to potentially return. Because a great martial arts movie, you come back to. The yeah. Matrix, the first one, is a great martial arts film. And you go back to it because it's so many layers. There's so yes. many layers to it that you can keep on discovering. And so Red Belt to me is actually, having watched it within the last year and being like, oh my God, this is still amazing. It's actually more amazing. <laughs> so... I'm like, okay, this is the, this is a great martial arts film, but it still needs it needs to be taken to that next level. Hence, petition. So we're, we're gonna I'm gonna start a petition. I'll include everybody on. I'll send it out. I'm gonna start. I'll start it today. Once I leave this, oh my god, get, yeah, I'll just go to the one of the petition sites and start it and send it out, and maybe we can put it out there. Oh you know, yeah, on all my platforms, which you know I don't get a zillion views, but uh, you know maybe we can build some momentum because it is Absolutely. it is an, an excellent. I mean, I, the acting in there is really what drew me in. The acting in there is is no, no. one's. You know how you you we see some of the movies, it's, and over the top is okay sometimes, but it's not okay all the time. And this one, no one was over the top. Everybody was kind of measured, but measured for their character. You know, and that yeah. that really was was very. It drew me in. You know, the martial arts, of course, and and the martial arts environment. But it's like, wow, this is. You know, I remember be, watching it in the theater, and I'm like, really, like I'm in that world, and like nothing else. You know, the person is kicking the seat behind me. I'm not really paying attention. Uh, you know, I don't even think I ate the popcorn. Just sat there. Cause I'm like really in this world. I'm like, this is, you know, I left the theater saying this is really like, I, it was a, an experience. Like I very rarely have those yeah. anymore with movies. This was like, yeah. what did I just, what did I just watch? Like, but not in a bad way. It's like, wow, this is kind of reminds me of how it was for me back in the day when I first loved Kung Fu movies, it's like yeah. total immersion. Yeah. And nothing else mattered. So at that point, what are some of your other favorite uh, martial arts, kung fu movies from any era? It doesn't matter. Oh, uh, we just recently watched Ghost Dog. Oh and, yeah, yeah. You know, I was and uh, Shion Meng is in that. The, my 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 Shaolin Temple teacher. He makes a cameo. He's the old man who spin kicks the guy in the alley. <laughs> and um, and when you the, the the when you're talking about that feeling with red belt the first film that comes to mind to me that, that also pulls you into a world that's an experience because there's like there's a lot that goes into that that feeling that we're talking about right now mm -hmm. and, and that feeling i i is is um it's you know for 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 what i work on from the startup standpoint like with the company real world what we're doing with justice for hire and like like what, what we think about a lot is is the formula like what is the math, essentially the math behind um, delivering an experience to to and helping someone else create an experience? So when I watch these films these days, I'm rewatching them because I'm actually looking for patterns. I'm looking for the mm -hmm. math. Then I, I like I actually have to write down and break down the math 
which then gets gets you know we have conversations about uh, uh, that with our our, our, our technology uh, lead and 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 with even more people than that. So um, Red Belt is is, is Red Belt uh, Ghost Dog Matrix. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of anything else that was made in the states. The first Ninja Turtles movie is actually pretty spectacular. Yeah, oh yeah. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie yeah. is, is another one. And 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 you know the majority of my uh, martial arts uh, cinema experience like really started with my parents and Shaw Brothers. Mm -hmm. So like I, for me, it takes me time to think about the American films that that really strike me as martial arts cinema because um, I, I really do think they're actually few and far between. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. There's stuff that I'm missing that I need to watch. You know, like they're like I, I don't know, but but you know, Shaw Brothers to me, like you know, there's there's the you know the kid with the golden arm, um, the the brave archer. Um, uh, we just rewatched the 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 thirty six chambers, uh, which of course it's actually shockingly long. <laughs> I'm like, I remember this is so long. I uh, I, I agree. It's a sweeping I, epic. Yeah, it's, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Uh, but you know, there, there's um, but I but those are my parents' favorites. Like I, they would take me as a baby to the Pagoda Theater in Chinatown, mm. and when that was a thing, and they would I would they would watch the double features and triple features. Of, of martial arts films um, at, at, in, in Chinatown. And so, so I was, I grew up in that, it, you know, sleeping to martial arts films. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to me personally, like resonating with something, it really starts with Jackie Chan and Winners and Sinners. Oh, yeah. And Winners and Sinners to me was, and it's, I need to rewatch it too, because it, to me it was, it was, it brought a level of what, of, <clears throat> modern urban drama like like the the environment it was it was so like growing up in new york i was always i want to see kung fu in the setting of new york mm -hmm. so seeing how they use kung fu in in like their environment in that like that that 1980s hong kong action cinema with samuel hong yim biao jackie chan back that yeah. the lucky stars team um that to me was was the pinnacle for me creatively of, of um, from an inspirational standpoint, like as a child, it's really foundational stuff for me. Um, and that scene where they fight in the uh, diner. Oh. And he kicks the guy out the window. Like we, I just referenced that because uh, we, were, we, were, we were looking to find a Kung Fu sound. We didn't use it though, but we were looking to find a Kung Fu sound that made it into Justice for Hire episode four. We needed one little sound of an impact <laughs> shot. And I'm like, no, this it can't be. It can't be a sound from from anywhere else. It has to be a kung fu movie sound from one of those films. And just we just need one split second of it, and and then we need to to kind of like DJ remix that. Yeah. So, so we, we did that, and um and it's it's pretty awesome. But like that that scene was one of the ones I was looking at because it's just like the pacing of the action, which is on a beat. You know, all Jackie mm -hmm. Chan stuff. I think they're they're on. I think it's a four beat or something like that. Like yeah. Their, their choreography is, is um, I, and I didn't, I wasn't even aware of the beats until I, I worked with great choreographers that really, you know, helped me give, give, give me a sense of choreography rhythm and also helped me experiment with breaking rhythm in choreography, mm -hmm. um, which is, I'd say that from, a, um, from, from what we've produced and the, the awards that we've gotten as a, as a martial arts uh, action team, um, they've mostly come from broken rhythm choreography. Mm. Um, so, and it was very, very intentional on our part to look at Jackie Chan and look at, you know, kind of say, okay, well, how, how do we do it now in, in, in America and, and not just in America, but like how, when you have a bunch of people who are martial artists, but some of them are actually like street fighters that have like, you know, that go into fights on the street on a regular basis. And you talk to them and you're like, okay, well, how do we, how do we, like, we really had to look at street fights. We had to really look and say, okay, well, how do you really apply your martial arts in the street? And then how do we take that mentality and bring it into choreography? Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of, a lot of that. And if you watch some of like the, the old stuff that we did, like JFH Brawl, uh, which, you know, predates the raid, you know, in terms of like, like highly specific shot for shot, like tying together kind of stuff. Um, and I was really happy that our team got, got recognized for that kind of stuff, you know, years before it became like a thing in, in, yeah. uh, in mainstream um, media. 
So, um, you know, but, but again, just kind of getting this attention, getting back to it, like Jackie Chan, you know, um, uh, just showed my son uh, uh, Rumble in the Bronx, which oh, I had never yeah. seen. I actually, oh. I, and I was like, oh my God, Rumble in the Bronx is amazing. Yeah, oh man. <laughs> what a Rumble. joyous show. Yeah, one of my, uh, I mean, I, I, when I speak about Wheels Jackie Chan, field. yeah, I can't say Wheel like, Wheel. one of my favorites because it's like, how do you, with, for me with Jackie Chan, I, I don't hate, like, if I say one of my favorites, I'm like, well, but no, then this one. Then you think, well, no, then this one. I just like Jackie Chan. That's what I, oh, yeah. that's what I say now. Two, a police story one. Oh, man. Oh. And, um, police story five is amazing. Yeah, it I is. I love police story five. Yes. Like, and, and what's that, what's that young actor's name? Like the guy, that the, he was like the young guy, the cool young guy in, in the um, story five. And he's amazing too. And, and uh, I, I used oh, to talk about him all the time. Yeah. It's a, is it Daniel? Is it Daniel Wu? And, uh, no, Daniel that, Wu is also in it, though. It, it, uh, Andy, about Andy Ohm? I can't. Okay, I need to look it up because I can't. I'm, I'm looking it up right now. Okay. <laughs> Story. Because he, he, he was like the, the uh, he was like the uh, Nicholas Say. There okay, yeah. That's he, was yes. <laughs> yeah. he was the yeah. heartthrob. Yeah. He was the heartthrob of the time. I was just like, yeah. I need to see another Nicholas Say movie. Oh, so I man. Feel like, <laughs> yeah, he, he, right I like him. Yeah, he's, I mean, Jackie and his crew are, uh, what more can you say, are, are amazing. I remember working at Blockbuster. Oh, I'm going to date myself. Nice. Back in the day. And we had like a which you're a wonderful guy to talk to about the films. Oh man, <laughs> no, nah, every no, nah, the customers didn't like me. They said I was too weird because I would go off and talk about like all these foreign movies. And so we had a we had a um, section that they had like we could have our favorites or whatever in the back of the store. And I had like Police Story because it was the only copy. So I'm like, please don't nobody mess this copy up. Police Story, Hard Boiled. You know, they had another John Woo. I think it was the Killer. And, you know, like all my stuff was littered with that. I never forget this, this customer. She's an older lady came in and I never wore a name tag. I'm like, I was the, like, I'm not name. I'm not, I'm nameless, you know? So she's like, who's that Gary guy? He's, he's crazy. Cause like, look at all those movies. I was like, like no, I was like, no, he has great taste. Go over him, go over him, police story. But long story, so I, used to, I used to get a lot of the, you know, younger guys. My, hey man, what's the watch? I said, please watch police story. And this was right before Jet and Jackie were really making their entrance into America. And I said, you yeah. got to watch Jet. I think they had one Jet Li movie. I can't remember what it was. I said, you got to watch these two. I said, if you do not watch these two, I said, you are going to come back and be amazed because you've never seen anything like what they can do. And they would, they would come back and, hey, man, you got any more of that stuff? And I'm like, well, you got to tell the manager to order some stuff. I'm just working here. But wow. it was... I remember seeing him. I was so blown away from Police Story 1. I think that final fight scene in the mall, I don't know how many times I rewound yep. it. Like, I just kept rewinding. I'm like, did he just? No, nah, he didn't. Yeah, he did. And, you know, I knew Jackie from, of course, the Drunken Master, you know, yep. uh, Young mm -hmm. Master. But when I Snake saw it's Snake and Eagle Shadow, all the classics. But when I saw Police Story, the That's first good. one, right, <laughs> I couldn't. Like, I couldn't, like, take my eyes off of it. And it's one of the ones to this day I can watch all the way through still and, like, wait, I didn't see that. Did he just? I think that's got to be my son's next Jackie Chan film. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's gotta be. man. And then part two, you know, all the police stories and, you know, and, of course, we cannot miss Samuel Hung. I mean, that's, that's another one. I mean, wow. You know, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. I still need to watch the, uh, the film that he directed. The um the Oscar the one that he directed about um uh, his childhood with Jackie Chan and Young in the oh um, um, I've never seen that and I painted to faces it. oh man that's a that's an excellent movie I was I never saw it until I got my hands on a, on a good legitimate copy last year oh wow that was such a good because I've always wanted to see it but you know it's grainy it's not really a good copy mm. it's kind of so i just said i don't know how i got it i think i just ordered it you know from uh from yes asia i think and man that's a good movie 
Like I'm people, I may watch that today. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, not <laughs> a lot of mar- it's, it's not any quote unquote martial arts. No fight scenes, but it's about their yeah. Peking opera training. And Samo, I don't know if he won an award for like yeah, his acting. Okay, his acting, like anybody, it might have been for like best directing actually. Really, because it was a great yeah. movie, but his acting was like he embodied who like I could feel his teacher. You know, it's mm. like he really embodied that role. And it's it's like you said earlier, it just goes to show you how these a lot of these people are so multi-talented that we yeah. really don't know until we get to see it. You think of Samuel just the fight choreography guy, the fighter, you know, in the movies. But no, he was yeah, you gotta watch that, man. You're gonna I will. You're and thank you for mentioning that. the killer, because that 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 movie means a lot to me. It was the uh um so the, I just rewatched it last year and it's the movie that made me want to become a director. I didn't know what a director was. And, you know, I grew up watching, you know, aside from Kung Fu movies, like, you know, you'd see American, essentially standard American fare, which is yeah. movie magic, which is Spielberg, which is, I love Robert Zemeckis. Like, you know, mm-hmm. um, like, but I didn't know, I did watching Back to the Future, I couldn't feel the director watching mm-hmm. Um, Star Wars, watching, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, pretty much anything from Steven Spielberg. I didn't know what a director was until, but then I saw The Killer and I'm like, what, what is this? This, this, this is, I feel different. Something's happening Mm -hmm. by how, how I, I was aware that I was being shown something in a different way. And, and it was just, it was a formative moment and it, and it came from, you know, my dad going to Defiant Comics to work with Jim Shooter and the guys there were like, hey, you need to watch John Woo. If you don't know, if you mm-hmm. love action you and you don't know about John Woo, you need to watch it. This was like 1990, like three or 91. <laughs> it was like 91 and I there. Yeah, it had to be like 92 actually, because it was like, it was like right, it was right after the kill, because um, Hard Boil was out and mm-hmm. Hard Boil was a 1992 release, if I remember correctly. Yes. The 1989 release. So, you know, I was, I was like nine, somewhere between nine and 11 years old when I saw this. And uh, so I think it was 11 years old. I was 11 years old mm-hmm. when I saw it. And the, um, we thought the killer was going to be hard boiled. Okay. So like, and when I, so like my, the, the guys were hyping up the wrong film and my dad brought the killer home rather than hard boiled. And just something in it besides knowing that I was being shown something differently there was also something that that resonated with me which actually uh, very personal I think that was I was going through some some pain at the time and like you mm-hmm. know I think that my uh, uh, parents divorce was going to come up at some point mm-hmm. uh, you know so there was like internal stuff I was dealing with that I was relating to the pain of the character in a certain way and the anger of the character of a certain way um, and watching the killer last year quite honestly Oh my God, I like this movie, <laughs> which, which I mean, like I love John Woo, but it was, it was interesting to feel the difference between that version of me that, that was inspired to become a filmmaker because of that film and the version of me now. And this is what, this kind of brings us back to the concept of like, of like being the scientist of your own life and running mm-hmm. tests, you know, because you're going to change over time. Right. And so I was recognizing like, wow, there's a lot of amazing things in here, but there's also things that that I'm, I'm no longer feeling inside myself. So I'm not as attached to it as I was previously. However, movies Seven Samurai from, from uh, Akira Kurosawa, I watched again last year and I was just like, oh my God, this is still, there's still something in here for me personally to dive in. And, and that's, and I'm, so when I say these things about like the killer, et cetera, um, I, I, I'm really talking about movies as a, tool for internal transformation which is actually what they really are and they're not really entertainment because entertainment is not really entertainment you're always programming yourself mm-hmm. so it's a yeah, <laughs> so like when i look at these things and i'm like hey you know whatever music you listen to whatever game you play whatever movie yeah. you watch oh yeah you're, you're actually programming yourself. and so when you really look at 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 time time under tension energy expenditure etc and how we condition ourselves um, with anything that you that you take part in, it's going to have ripple effects throughout your body, like physical, mm. like that's, there's a bunch of data on that, your body, mind, your spirit. 
So when I watched The Killer, I was like, whatever I needed from this film, I got, and it pushed me to here, and I still hold it in reverence, but I changed, and now there are other things that I have to look at to take the, to keep the steps going. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but then I look at something like Ghost Dog, where Ghost Dog, originally, I, I always felt the vibe of it, but I didn't really love the movie. I just loved aspects of it. And I love mm -hmm. that, that, that one, that, that hero track, the soundtrack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that song. Um, <laughs> I love that. But, but, but then watching it again, like earlier this year, a few weeks ago, I was like, oh my God, this is actually like, I need to pay attention to Ghost Dog <laughs> because I'm watching a lot of Charlie Chaplin right now. And I'm like, Charlie Chaplin is one of the most modern things I'm watching because of where mm -hmm. social media is going. Like a lot of stuff that Charlie was doing back in 1919 is actually very similar to how where we're going with with uh, with content uh, format. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, okay, like, and I watch Ghost Dog, and they have these title cards in there with these messages that pre-frame the next scene. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my god, man! And like that last line, I, I don't the spoiler spoiler alert, like <laughs> ended important in all things, you know, like with the little girl and and you know pulling the trigger and the guy reacting even if nothing comes out, like that kind of stuff, that poetry. Uh, like, yeah. I talk to you about that anyway. No, <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, that's what, that's what we want to hear. Killer. Yeah, this is, but that's, that's what we, you know, want to hear. And, the, and you make a lot of interesting and true points. Now, I'm thinking about when I watch certain stuff because it's some stuff that I used to love and now I watch them like, ah, okay. But it's not that same. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I might, like you said, like an aspect of it. I'm like, oh, that was cool. But then I'm like, um, it's the same feeling you have. I'm like, yeah, I used to watch this. Like, that's how I'm like, you know, and it's just because I have changed. You know, I've gotten older. I won't say how much older from them, but I've gotten older, life experiences. And then your perspective, particularly if, if you, I think if you're a martial artist, you really study your perspective, like changes. I mean, even for me in Capoeira, what was once important to me inside the art is no longer... Mm it's important because it's part of the art, but it's not of a personal importance. There's other things, and I, and I do feel that my, cap, my personal capital has gotten more internal. Like my, I'm more feeling about things of the interaction between me and someone else, as opposed to just being able to do this move. Like I've, I've felt I've, I've gotten away from just being able to, to do this sweet move, but more like, okay, that's nice, but what's more important is just minute interaction where we have a point where it's not a fight of course but that person could have pulled me in that takedown and now my reaction is i have to i have to escape in a in a method in a way that puts me in an advantageous position either defensively or offensively mm -hmm. and so that's what when i train personally that's what i train it's more important than back in the day so when i'm watching movies it's the same i'm like God, i used to like that and it's not that i don't like it but i'm like questioning like why did i used to like that and now i'm looking I'm like it's okay but it's like yeah so that's like super interesting but like i love that you just drew the parallel between your 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 taste in film and your um what you value as in your martial arts training because because that, that exact parallel you just drew to me is the value of, of, of recognizing your, what we of, of a human being or us as a culture, recognizing entertainment as a mirror. Mm -hmm. And if we look at, if we understand that when we look at something that we like, that we're entertained by, we're actually seeing something of ourselves in there. And yes. that thing that we're seeing of ourselves in there is actually, it's not just us seeing it. But something comes back into us that we need to spend time contemplating. Yeah, and 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 you actually need to look at that and figure out how <clears throat> how it speaks to you. What uh, what does that help you do from an evolutionary standpoint? Like what? Mm -hmm. Okay, there's something inside here that I need to think more deeply about because it's going to affect my behavior. Yeah, and behavior with the world and what my purpose is in the world. And if you contemplate that, find being the scientist in your own life like test your theories, get the information back, it will change you. And then the thing that you watched, you can look at as a previous version of yourself. Yeah. And as the new version of yourself.
these two versions of yourself looking at the same thing. Like, I used to like that because of this, but now I feel like this. So what is next? Yeah. And how can I keep on peeling away the layers of the onion to get to that core? Because when I do that, I get brighter. Life gets mm -hmm. better. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and you get happier <laughs> and, you, and you're happier. But I think sometimes, I think this is important that you as, as a multimedia uh, creator and a filmmaker, fans need to hear this because sometimes I would, honestly, I would feel guilty about not liking something that that mm -hmm. i used to be like why don't i and i would try to force myself like wow why don't i, why don't I like this movie anymore wow. it's not it's i don't like it but it just doesn't speak to me like it once did because like you know even some old kung fu i'm like that was like i used to really like wow. and i would feel guilty like what is what is <laughs> am i wrong for not liking this anymore or not it's not necessarily not liking is a bad word but not being affected like I once was by like okay it's all right but I might not watch that again I could not watch it again for another 10 years and be okay you know and I used to I felt so guilty like why am I am I abandoning especially when it was kung fu movies am I like abandoning kung fu movies Dude, you're blowing my mind yeah it's I'm <laughs> serious it, it's and and I never really understood it you know and even some stuff that's that's that I like or that's modern that I watch that's in a vein of something. And I'm like, oh, I'm not feeling this. And then I, I will feel good to him like, but I'm, it's martial arts. I'm supposed to like it. Wow. Like, and then I'm like, well, am I, you know, this all this internal conversation. Am I supposed to like it? Or have I just evolved to a point? Like for me earlier in my earlier younger days, the fight scenes were super important. It's gotta look this way. It's gotta, because it was exciting and now i'm like even with rail belt when we're speaking about that it's like what drew me now the fight scenes were good and you know we're gonna put this petition out to see if we can get a, a better cut but it's it's the story and the characters that really kept me whereas let's say 15 years ago maybe it wasn't i didn't care i just wanted a visceral experience of this fight scene looks good but now I'm watching stuff and the fight scenes are good. I'm like, but I'm not feeling the characterization. I'm like, it's too, it's mm -hmm. too shallow. But then yeah. I, then in my mind, I'm like, well, it's martial arts. I should like it. I should want to see it again. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't. I want to see, I still want to see some good martial arts, but I want to see a character develop because maybe I'm developing in my life too, as I get older. I, mean, I want to see this character not act this way if it's like you know fast forward and the film is 10 years later but the character's acting the same way i'm like this is no no character development i want to see that along with decent fight scenes and but i will feel so guilty i know i can't be the only one but i will feel so guilty about not liking um certain things that i used to like i'm like why don't i like this anymore <laughs> It's just interesting. That's super powerful, and 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 what what you what you just you just hit me so hard because we, <clears throat> yeah, this is this is what I, like what we're talking about is literally what I I have to work on every day, mm -hmm. which is essentially figuring out, um, looking deeper into what fandom is, like that's my, that's really my daily experience, like mm -hmm. like, and I'm very very grateful for that because there's so much power in us. And in each and every one of us, and it sounds cheesy, but it's actually like, it's, 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 it is the absolute truth. Like, it's like, like even, you know, even science, the study of will tell you that, you know, like there's this massive power in a single atom. <laughs> you yeah, know? True. So it's just like what you just said in terms of the guilt, the, the, like the guilt of fandom, the, mm -hmm. the guilt of, feel, of, of community. Um, and and feeling that you are a part of something, but you're only a part of something if you agree with these things. Yeah. And and if you don't, if you if you, I mean, this is this is the challenge of the, it's the challenge of, of religion. It's the challenge of of so many different yeah. disciplines. You're not a kung fu stylist if you do these things. Yes. Like like to go beyond style. You know what Bruce Lee says. Like mm -hmm. to be water. Like what one of the interesting things about what Bruce Lee says is that like, you know, to be water, to go beyond style, from my experience, you actually have to know style to get yes. style. Yo, I so, totally agree. So the, like <laughs> Yeah, totally agree. So it's really interesting if you're if you're in the 
you, I, I have to contemplate. I have to quietly think deeply about what you just said about the guilt of fandom and how to, in the creation of like the system that we're building with real world, how to make sure that people are aware that that's going to happen. Yeah. Like you really just hit me hard because if you can let somebody know that, hey, you're going to love this. You're going to find inspiration here. And then one day it's no, the things that serve you here will no longer serve you, but that's okay because we're going to have another le level for mm -hmm. you to go. And you're always going to be able to find a higher level. And even if you leave us, you are still one of us because you are seeking the highest version of yourself. And that makes you part of our community. That to yeah. me is something you, that you just inspired in me. So thank you so, so much because I need to talk to our whole team about that. And it's a huge deal. So oh, you're you. welcome. <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking of that. And, and you, you know, something you said, I'm like, I, I just couldn't figure out why I would feel this way. I mean, it's, it's been recent, man. I've, I've seen MCU movies. And I go back and try to rewatch. I'm serious, like Ultron, Age of Ultron. Oh, yeah. I tried to go back and rewatch it. I really tried. And I just, I got through about half of it. And I said, I can't, I just can't. And I, it's not that it's a bad film. It's just something. And I'm like, I can't. And I just cut it off. I'm like, I can't. I don't know why. I don't know. You know, I couldn't really put my finger on it. But as I'm watching, I'm like, I'm just not feeling this like I, I did. Very specific perspective of what, <laughs> of what the MC, what the MCU me meant for culture or means for culture and where it's where culture is going because of it. Oh, let's hear it. <laughs> so like I, 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 I totally know exactly what you're talking about, because to, to a certain extent, these movies, um, you know, like what, what has Marvel really done? That's amazing. Well, you have Black Panther, which is, the, mm -hmm. in my opinion, potentially the greatest superhero film of all time, um, and if not if not top three, but it, it, it could be because of its importance for global mm -hmm. culture, could be the most important superhero film ever made. And so that's one. Then you have the introduction of a shared universe, yes. which has been around since the monster movies of the 50s, at the very least, if not prior. Um, but the, the formalization of the, the best practices of, of story world building, which are in the comic book, Marvel and DC's comic book storytelling mm -hmm. principle, really more so Marvel's, the more than DC. Marvel was, was from its inception a little bit more uh, dynamic with that. Yeah. Um, so so you have, you have this, the, the story world introduction, which is two, uh, shared story world. And then essentially you have what? Um, I don't know. I, th third, with, th third to me is kind of like interchangeable of, of essentially saying, hey, we ha we're, we're really great at picking, uh, uh, you know, wonderful filmmakers and casts and putting them together and bringing lots of joy. So like, I love yeah. that, you know, like I love, I love, I love that. So th maybe those three things, like they're consistently bringing the joy, you know, they brought the shared universe model and they're, they're, uh, you know, they made Black Panther. So yeah. but, like, outside of that, like I, I really look at these these movies, especially with some of the you know, I, there's a difference between movie and TV casting, and mm -hmm. it's not really spoken about a lot. Um, but there's the, literally the physical faces of the people that you would choose to be on a television set traditionally are are different than the types of people you would choose the physical faces that you would choose to be on on a film screen, and I feel like a lot of their their casting choices have been you know going against that. Uh, to a certain extent, but also um, uh, light just ran out. So I'm just going to, this battery just ran out. But, but what I'm getting at is that there's, um, uh, you know, essentially these, I think these movies are, are, essential, uh, are putting us in a position to recognize, I, you know, Steven Spielberg, I'll put it this way. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas said that the superhero film was a fad. And mm -hmm. I disagree. I, uh, that, that it would pass like, um, like any, uh, like the cowboy film, like, right. the, like right. uh, et cetera. Like, like it would just be a, a, a passing phase and then it would come back. And I was like, I totally disagree with that. The reason I totally disagree with that is because what superheroes mean in terms of the timing of culture for us watching them, when you look at these pictures as, a, as, a, as, a, as mirrors, like humans have, have gotten to a point and, and this is undeniable at this point, everybody's evolving. 
COVID was a great example of the amount of internal people had to go inward. And mm -hmm. what's the repercussions of people going inward will be felt for the rest of our lives. Yes. So like, and so what, what's happened with the superhero culture is it's actually set us up for a hero's culture mm -hmm. to shift from a victim culture or, or from a blame culture and into a, a hero culture where people are actually becoming the heroes in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing this across marketing. You're seeing this in so many different sectors where like, you can be a hero, yeah. your story, all this other stuff. Like, what, you know, everything that, that I've been like, essentially my life's work, you know, which I'm putting in the real world, you know, is, is setting up for this moment. And I'm so grateful to be here because I'm just like, man, like, this is awesome. Like people, these superhero films are reminding us that we're all together in a shared universe, mm -hmm. that we're, we all have the power to step up and make the world, like to change the world physically ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so when you have that type of example, it goes beyond fad. If you look at what's happening with like Gen Z and younger uh, right now in terms of how they've taken the superhero culture to heart and brought that into their narratives. Yeah. And, and, to, and it's just like really, really interesting. Like we've gotten to a point where consumption in media is, has become so, uh, it, it, like, do, it, like, it, it's so deeply woven into us that now something's coming mm -hmm. out. And what's coming out is happening. TikTok is just the beginning. You know, like TikTok obviously was musically before that. It's been around for a very long time. But TikTok exploding last year is just mainstream. It's the mainstream culture seeing what's been bubbling. And so I see the superhero film. I see MCU as essentially having given us, because if you look at the Marvel comic books, they're kind of the same thing all the time. Yeah. yeah. So like Marvel and DC comics, like God bless them. Like they're, 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 they've been the same thing for a very long time. And so they're constantly telling these stories and they're telling you more and more and more. And like, you know, and DC is a, is a, is a I think DC has the biggest opportunity in, in films, honestly, um, because of their foundation uh, in, in, in essentially as heroes as gods. Yes. I think, I think that, that heroes as gods um, is actually going to be a major shift in the coming 10 years. Um, but, but right now, like with people just starting to be, to recognize the hero inside themselves, the Marvel model is really only valuable for us catalyzing something inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's when you say, Hey, I'm watching this movie and it doesn't feel the same to me. It's the same thing as me with, with the killer and being mm -hmm. like, okay, whatever I needed, I got, and now there's something else that needs to yeah. be be done with this and that means that story is going to change like the model of storytelling is going to change it's not going to be the same hero's journey model and and that's because culture is no longer the same like and this is this is you know i highly recommend checking out jeff gomez who's a dear mm -hmm. friend and advisor uh and he's the leading transmedia producer he's the leading mind in transmedia storytelling and he talks about collective journey storytelling mm -hmm. and the shift of uh, you know the hero's journey is there's a, the hero needs to leave the village to go slay the dragon, to go get fire and bring fire back to the village so everyone has fire. Mm -hmm. That's the old model. We're in the new model where the problems are systemic, meaning that yeah. not one hero can solve it. Actually, all of them need to be working together. Facebook was the big shift between the old model and the new model in terms of like social media in general, but like Facebook, meaning that everybody's story now is actually like connected. And we all have to talk about things to heal and to build. Mm -hmm. So the healing and the building, this cinematic universe model, this inspiring hero inside of us that, that is coming out, like these stories are changing. The narrative has to change. And if you look at the announcements from Disney, at, from Disney and Warner from earlier this year and from late last year, and, you know, I was privy to this a year before. I knew it was happening, but someone else kind of, uh, uh, a guy named Matthew Ball, who's, who's uh, head of content at, at Amazon, brought this to the attention of the, an audience at, at um, Tribeca International Film mm -hmm. Festival, not Tribeca, Toronto International Film Festival, that essentially the next wave that was going to be happening in Hollywood was outsourcing. And mm -hmm. outsourcing the Hollywood model um, to shipping it out so that other areas of the world have the same thing to tell their stories. Uh, from America, from Hollywood, shipping out the model and saying, hey, Raya the Last Dragon. Hey, we're, we're, we're like, 
the continent in Africa of Africa is going to have their own ability yeah. to tell on stories the way we tell them. Hey, we're doing this in Asia. Like Warner saying, hey, we're setting up all these superheroes in Asia and Batman around the world and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. So like essentially these models are being, are being uh, shipped out. So what does that mean for us, for, for America? And, what is, and this is my main focus, like knowing that the models are being shipped out, knowing that the old heroes model, because these companies don't know about the collective journey storytelling on the mm -hmm. left. They're, they're aware of it, but they're too scared. <laughs> they, they can't, and they're not nimble enough or young enough to be able to move uh, to, to adapt to what collective journey storytelling is right now. They're attempting to from their, their, their very solid positions Hence Netflix and Adobe doing their partnership right. with like for, Pit, for TikTok to try to find the next story, et cetera, which is great. It's awesome. But what does that mean for America? And what does that mean for us who watched all those Marvel movies, who live in the in the country and in the world and in the city? If you're in New York and I'm from New York, in the city, you know, that that birthed it. What does that mean for the home of those models? the home of those models has to evolve because we're not going to stay stagnant. We're not going to stay at the same level while the rest of the world catches up in terms of storytelling, uh, in terms of being able to have great animations and great awesome films about their stories that, that, you know, that the whole world can see. I want to see the Filipino stories. I want to see mm -hmm. the stories from all across the world, but I know that America as an originator of this style of storytelling, even though the hero's journey, like, you know, Joseph Campbell, hero with a thousand right. faces, it's very, very old, but Hollywood storytelling is American. Yes. So what is next for America? And to me, it is exactly what we're talking about right now in terms of like the recognition that we are so rapidly evolving from what we've seen with, with Marvel, which the, 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 the Avengers Endgame to me is the greatest theatrical experience that a person can have. Yes. Like, you, I, there's nowhere to go from there except I, if you are in it. Right. There's nowhere else to go unless you are in the story. And that to me is the, that is the, that, that, that's it. Like that's the goal. That is that is the, 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 the that is where all my focus is going. Knowing that that room full of people, the only way to take that to the next level with eighty years worth of character development that Marvel has, that the only thing to trump that is your story, because your story plus my story plus their story together on screen changes us. Yeah, and that to me is the future of filmmaking. <laughs> yeah, that's, and and look. That I, I agree because we we evolve so quickly. Like I just yeah. So if if someone wants to be a part of Justice for Hire, tell the audience how how that can happen. What what do we have to do oh. to be our own? Went <laughs> <laughs> went off there. <laughs> no, that's that's right into what I yeah. No, that's right what so, we. Uh, so Justice for Hire again. It's a cinematic universe that we're building with our community. Anybody can join first of, it's the first production from Real World, which is our startup studio. It's the first social film studio. We're making movies and shows with the world. Justice for Hire is our first show. You can go to justiceforhire.com and you'll see the, the link to the app there. It's a web app that you can access right from your phone and download right directly. We circumvent Apple and Google this way. Uh, we will launch on Apple and Google, um, and Apple and Android uh, eventually, but right now we're doing it via the, um, through the website and through our own web app. So, um, but essentially th that site has tons of assets, um, it has the series that you can watch. Uh, it has assets that you can download to make your own versions of the story. But when you go into the app, which is a justice for hire dot app, um, you become a character. You choose your role as a hero, a client or villain. Again, justice for hire is like Uber, but for heroes. Mm -hmm. Or you can hire a hero or become one and get paid. So that premise and the app unite our heroes, our, our now worldwide, since we've gone to a viral on TikTok, we have heroes worldwide. So uh, you're, we're all united on a single app and we're telling stories together as our own characters. And as the weeks go on, like we're going to launch something today. We're going to launch a, a, a new functionality today. Cool. Uh, DM, <laughs> direct messages. So um, as the weeks go on, you'll see more and more functionality added to the app. And um, it was it was going viral on TikTok that really pushed us to even launch early because we were like, oh, we're not done yet. But, but you know, there's all these millions of people like looking at us, so let's do something. And so right. now we're 
you know, at 7.5 million views later, we're like, okay, cool. Uh, let's, <laughs> you know, wow. we're, we're still building. So episode four comes out next week. Um, those first four episodes are like the starter pack that okay. allow, um, that essentially give the audience a sense of how the universe works. And we want people to be able to watch this. And, and uh, uh, if, you've, if you've seen the last couple of weeks, we have, mm -hmm. we have a partnership with Watch the Hate, which is, you know, focused on, uh, 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 you know, addressing the, the anti-Asian sentiment that's out there right now. We're like, well, hold on for a second. How can we, fictionalizing solutions to real world problems, which is part of our theme, like this is all fiction, but how do we use story, knowing that it's a mirror for ourselves, how do we mm -hmm. use story to ideate, to think about how to solve problems in a different way? How do we use the hero's culture, the hero's side? And that, that means some people, one person did a martial arts action scene, mm -hmm. you know, someone else, did, you know, was uh, chose peace and meditation and Tai Chi, you know, rather than fighting the person that, 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 that has brought negativity to them. There's all these different ways and solutions, but, you know, I'm a big Star Trek fan. So, you know, when I, and when I say a big Star Trek fan, I don't mean I'm a fan of the franchise mm -hmm. that is managed by people I don't know that are not Gene Roddenberry. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of Gene Roddenberry's vision that, that and, 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 and as a visionary, the visionary brings a very particular, in their lifetime, a very particular energy to a property. They're the champion of the property. So Gene Roddenberry, what he did and what he accomplished with, with Star Trek, the next generation to me, but the first, uh, that was my favorite, but the first Star Trek in terms of essentially creating cell phones. Dude, yeah. create, like, like they, Star Trek inspired the cell phone, inspired so many medical breakthroughs. And so if it wasn't for people looking at how a future could be, they wouldn't have taken action in, in now. And so for Justice for Hire, we consider it near future sci-fi. Mm -hmm. This is sci-fi that takes place days in the future. We're like, rather than five years ahead of time, 50 years ahead of time, Justice for Hire is about an app where we're all heroes, where, we're, we, where the, your fellow like human being can go and help you with a problem to help bring justice to the world in a world that is rampant with, with cynicism and red tape that doesn't allow you to get the, the world to get the, the 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 righteousness that it deserves at the moment that it that's necessary so like like we're building a hero's culture and again it's a show it's just a show but it's so much more because entertainment is so much more and so we, we're really looking at ourselves um, and we want people to see themselves by becoming that in these stories. that that is profound so go to what's the website justiceforhire.com go to justiceforhire.com sign up i'm going to sign up i want a mask though but anyway oh, so i'm going to we have heroes with masks. I, want a mask, yeah. man. <laughs> I got like this crazy lucha wrestling mask I want. That's awesome that's yeah, awesome. It's, it's sitting right in this corner oh, oh, do you have a hero name no not yet okay okay i, I was thinking see I, I got this five deadly venom mask that i got from the five deadly venom mask guys i can't remember the names at the urban action showcase i got a couple but i was talking to the guy about making me one because i I like call myself the 12th Venom and everybody asked me about that. I'm like, it's not that I'm number 12. It's only five Venoms. It's like I'm the 12th generation in my own story. That's awesome. And so that's that's why I call it the 12th Venom. Oh my God, people, that's so dope. People ask me like, oh, is it is only five? I'm like, no, it is five. But like this was set back in ancient China. So now it's now and I'm like, 12 came to my mind i'm like i'm the 12th generation of the poison clan or something so i'm the 12th so cool. but i was gonna have him make me like a, a a a personalized mask but i can't think of any venom that that they don't already have just like not sucky like a stingray is like okay but this little stingray will be on the top it'll look like crazy so i'm still conceptualizing that but i do want the mask though had like the mask on that'll be my hero name <laughs> Dude, stuff, so, so please let me Nikki, like I'm happy to to uh, and I offer this to the whole community um, essentially like development uh, you know like okay. uh, like Hollywood development practices um, to, to you know before pre-production etc like I am I'm here so if you want to talk about developing your story and and um, like you know maybe before you go to camera or like the development process of, to a certain extent because what real world is doing is truncating the, the Hollywood, the entire life cycle of a film or television show in, into our processes. So if you, um, so I think there's value in you shooting a hero video as soon as possible. That yeah. being said, like I, 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 I love this idea and I would love to 
uh, you, you know, work with you in, in any capacity to build out. Because what we what we see with what we're doing is that everybody owns their hero in Justice for Hire. Right. Like, like you, you contributing to is not you giving away your rights for your property. It's actually, it, we're providing a platform where we believe we're going to find the next like 100 Deadpools on here. Right, right. And because people are going to create their own hero, it's going to be awesome. Other people are going to love it. And then whatever comes of that type of, 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 of energy is yours to do what do with it what you will. If you want your own, if, if you get a feature film deal with a studio, mm -hmm. you know, based on your character or is starring you, that to me is, a, is, a, is an ideal and that's great for everybody. So my intention personally is to provide as much development um, processes as possible so that, so that your foundational story is, is, it has enough, as much depth and, and, you know, and, and interconnectivity to, so that other people can join in and, and, and build with you um, as possible. So that like, I love the five deadly venoms. Someone actually approached us years ago because uh, you know, I, I still run a comic book company through Creative Impulse, my, my production company. And with a, a five venoms property, Oh. And it was based on the five daily venoms. And I was just like, well, hold on for a second. This is really based on it. And I had to do the research and find out the celestial pictures, yeah. Oh, yeah. All, you know, owns the rights to all those, those yeah. uh, old Kung Fu movies. So I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to get involved too deeply with, with like pulling directly from that mythos, <laughs> mm. but you with the 12th venom to me is like perfect. So like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I'm gonna reach out then, man. I, 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 I got some ideas. So we, we'll talk, but I'm gonna reach out. That's good. See, this is a great conversation. And, you know, um, how can, how can, speaking of reaching out to you, how can um, people get in touch with you? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm available. I'm all over social, you know, like <laughs> at Jan Lucanus. Um, okay. So it's just my name. Uh, but essentially, and I'm super responsive, but I think the main, uh, you know, when it comes to like justice for hire and people like coming to us with, um, uh, you know, like their own ideas and building that out. I mean, we're even shooting in New York. We're doing, you know, we'll be, you know, COVID style, um, you know, following some protocols, but we're shooting in New York in late June, early July. Wow. So we're actually centralizing a bunch of our heroes that are in the tri-state area to make cameos in um a, a, a part of an episode that's going to be in our first season. So the episodes cool. one to four that are, that are, you know, be out fully by next week. Um, again, they're the starter pack, but we actually shot an entire season of the oh, show. Wow, cool. And that, that still need, that still needs post-production, but like we've, we figured out, we're like, hold on, there's certain aspects that are not there yet that we need to integrate. So that's why we're shooting in July. Cool. Um, that sounds great. June and July. So yeah, it's gonna be great. That's so people can actually be in it. And if you're on the app, um, you know, you'll see uh, within the next couple of days, you'll see uh, a, a little button you can press and you can reach out and say, hey, I, this is my hero name. I want to be in this this piece. Wow, that is so, that is so cool. Well, thank you for doing that. This is going to be great. And I want to, uh, you know, thank you for your time. This was a great conversation. I definitely want to keep talking with you, you know, beyond this and more because I, I like your ideas. I like your positivity. And, you know, we might have to do a part two of this one uh, at some point in the future, because I really, I want to get into some more martial arts type of stuff, but this is, this has been great. I want to thank you again, Sifu you. Jan, for, for joining us. And I know people are going to love this. And this is the 12th Venom signing off with Sifu Jan, and we'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs> thank you guys. Love you. Thank you so much, brother. This is